Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah, I can. So, uh, guys, I want you to welcome Keith. Um, just as a reminder, this is for educational purposes only. None of this should be considered investment advice. Consult your financial professional. Uh, options have risk. Commodities have risk. Futures have risk. Uh, with that, uh, Keith is going to present you a, a little primer on trading options on commodities. Uh, thanks, Keith. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, so um, again, thank you guys all for coming. We're really excited about uh, getting an opportunity to do this today. So uh, as Mark mentioned, a um, little introduction for myself. I have a generally quantitative background, but I'm not a quant uh, in any sense of the way. I'm not a high-frequency trader. Um, I look at options and I think about what they are doing, and that came from my background of being an options market maker, um, prop trader, and I work for a CTA commodity trading investor, and I do a lot of their... Uh, strategy options, looking at all the commodities, I've traded equities, fixed income commodities, I mean commodities are some of the most exciting things. Um, if you look at the big names, obviously gold, oil, natural gas, everything is very exciting right now uh, as it starts to come out of this generally bearish commodity environment. One of today is an introduction overall to some of these commodities, and then we're going to really focus on gold because gold, I think, is the most universally known commodity. And it's also the easiest for you guys to get involved with. It's got a very liquid ETF. You can start there. If you find some success and some more interesting commodities, then you're going to want to start going into uh, futures and options on futures. But those require a different type of account than what many of you probably have. Most of you are probably set up for equities and equity options. And that's great. We can do that with gold. You can do that with silver. You can do that with oil. You can do that with natural gas. But gold, of course, is the, uh, the most liquid ETF in the commodity space. I want to go through some simple structures once we talk a little bit further on gold. And then we're going to try to fit this trade to your normal trading style. I think everybody here has had some experience trading options. You've started to get a sense of what your style is. And we want to make sure that you guys are trading the way that you want and not getting caught up in how somebody else likes to trade. If you end up in a situation where I tell you that you have to be short premium and you're not comfortable with that, then that doesn't work for anybody. All you're going to do is get yourself out of the trade before it can work. So then we want to look through how to execute the right kind of structure and what traps to avoid falling into. So let's do a little uh, brief introduction on commodities themselves. Commodities fall into a number of different categories. Uh, I mentioned gold, there's silver, there's platinum, palladium, those are the precious metals generally. There's you know others there, but that's generally what you're looking at when you're talking about the precious metals. The only liquid options for the precious metals are going to be in gold and silver. Platinum and palladium, uh, you would have to trade futures exclusively almost. They do have options, but they just don't trade that much. But gold and silver uh, give you a lot of great opportunities for trading precious metals. You have the base metals, copper, nickel, aluminum, zinc. Generally speaking, those are going to be a little less with as well. But they are very interesting, and they do give you a perspective on what's going on in the global macroeconomic world. Then we get into the energies, oil and natural gas, both very exciting right now. We've seen a lot of movement out of oil. We've seen a lot of movement out of natural gas. We're going to touch on that in the bigger class, but today that's not going to be our focus because we only have a limited amount of time, and so we're going to go with the big boy gold. Um, continuing on, we've got agricultural, uh, soybeans, corn, and wheat, your normal grains and oil seeds. We've got sugar, coffee, cotton, cocoa, and orange juice. Those are your soft commodities, generally speaking, and then you've got cattle and hogs. All of these have uh, very good option markets in general, um, but it's all off of the futures. And then finally, we've got very liquid ETFs for gold, silver, oil, and natural gas. And that's part of the reason we're really focusing on gold here is because of these liquid ETFs and that ability to access a very big, very exciting market. So as an introduction to gold overall, gold has a number of different purposes. I think when people look at their portfolio, a lot of times when you're looking at a, uh, a balanced portfolio, people talk about making sure that you have a certain exposure to gold and commodities as an inflation hedge, as a currency hedge, as a hedge for central banks. When you have no confidence in the central bank and you don't know what's going to happen to your currency, people tend to look for a flight to safety. That's gold in general. Um, again, risk hedges. When you see the S&P crashing and what we saw you know, for uh, 2008 and 2009, people look for a flight to quality or a flight to safety, something that's going to basically keep them from that end of the world scenario that we put in quotes down there. Uh, finally, I think it's been widely debated whether gold is a gift and good. I'm not going to make my opinion here, but generally what a gift and good is is as the price rises, demand actually increases. And I think you see that characteristic in gold. As the price rallies, investment demand does tend to increase. 
maybe it's because everybody's buying it for the same reason, but generally speaking, that creates that explosive upside. As gold goes higher, you start hearing people talk about you know, $10,000, $20,000 an ounce gold. Right now we're trading around $1,300 an ounce. It's a good level for us, right? Back when we were trading around $1,100, the interest in the product was a little lower, but as we get a little bit higher and a little bit more exciting and a little bit more talking about it, it creates these really good trading opportunities. And that's what we're looking for now, is how to get these great trading opportunities. A little more about gold here and the equities markets. This is going back uh, since 2008. You can see that equities had a nice dip down there at the uh, beginning of two, end of 2008 and early 2009, and gold was basically on a one-way trend upward. Uh, peaked out in um, about July of 2011 as we got into quantitative easing, and then as that faded away in 2013, it started to fall, fall back down. So we've had a nice long uptrend, a downtrend, and right now we're starting to look like we may be starting to go into a more bullish trend again. Over the course of these eight years, we've had an increase in price from about $90 to uh, 127 I believe, was the last price in yield. At the same time, uh, equities have rallied about 100%, from 100 to over 200 on the SPY index. So let's go into the options. General discussion about gold here, it is a very big macro product. That is what most people use gold for. You're looking for exposure to the macroeconomic world. You're talking about uh, exposure to things like central bank um, decisions. You've got non-farm payrolls. Everything that's coming into the market uh, on a daily basis gets into the gold market. This is not like your standard uh, ETF or individual equity where you're waiting for news. There's almost constantly macroeconomic news, whether it's a war, whether it's uh, uh, planned events. There is always interest here. It has a similar implied vol level to the S&P 500. So those of you that are looking at what kind of implied vol level we're looking at, it's right around that 16% level right now, a little higher than S&P 500, but generally it tends to go a little bit in line with that. Part of that is, again, because of that uh, uh, risk assets um, status. When you see the S&P dropping, gold tends to rise at a similar rate. And so what does that mean? That means we have a call skew. Um, for those of you thinking about the skew here, when you picture your S&P skew, the puts are higher than the calls. In gold, it is usually the other way. I don't want to say always because there are certain times when it switches. I can give you an example. In 2013, when gold dropped about $200 over the course of a week, put skew obviously came up as we had such panic buying of protection for people that had been gold bugs for a long time. But generally speaking, call skew is there, and that's actually where we get a little bit more of an opportunity for the bull because it makes the if you're buying call spreads, the higher strike call has a higher volatility, and thus you're getting a little bit of a better deal on the call. A lot of this is driven by people buying a lot of outright calls as ways to hedge, and you get this panic buying uh, effect as well. So you've got some reasons why people don't want to constrain their upside uh, in gold. Um, that is what really generates that call skew situation. When the market gets excited about, about gold, the opportunity show up, and when the market doesn't care, honestly, you guys probably don't care. So when gold was trading $1,100 an ounce and nobody cared about gold, the daily volume in gold was very low and people just didn't want to trade it that much. If you've got a situation where gold is in a sideways boring market, you probably have a better opportunity to put your capital somewhere else. But the good news is that right now, the market is starting to care again. So you've got some interest coming into the market and that's driven by a lot of what's going on in central banks right now. You've got negative rates, uh, virtually globally and people are hunting for yield and they don't have a lot of confidence in what central banks are doing. And so that's what people are putting some money into gold again and starting to hedge their portfolios and starting to look for ways to get yield that does not involve just simply buying bonds that are going towards 0%. Let's go a little bit back here and look at the gold and S&P implied vols. So as I mentioned before, the uh, implied vols tend to track each other pretty well. <clears throat> Excuse me. The big difference you see there in 2013 was generally driven by that big stuff that we saw on gold. But generally, the, uh, the gold options tend to track pretty well with the implied ball to S&Ps. So if you're looking for your opportunities and you think that uh, you're looking for a macro product to trade and you're looking for a way to buy a cheap option, if gold is trading at a discount to S&P ball and you're looking for a little bit of protection to your portfolio, that might be a way you can do it. But we're generally looking for those two to stay a little bit in line. I'm not going to go into too much more with the uh, volatility arbitrage type trade here between gold and SQI because that's not really the focus of our webinar. We really want to focus on the opportunities in gold individually. If you look at the implied and historical vol levels again, we're around 16% historically. You do have those spikes into the 30s, 
but generally you're talking about a relatively low volatility product when you compare it to some of the individual equity names that a lot of you guys are going to be looking at. You know, you've got some, you know, some of these uh, names that are an 80% volatility, implied volatility, looking for 5% daily moves. Gold, you're not looking for that. You're looking for a 16% volatility, which is going to imply about a 1% expected daily move in price. So when I go through my options trades, I always try to set up a little bit of my framework before I get too excited about what kind of structure I'm looking for. So the first thing I always ask myself is where is implied vol relative to the normal range? If I expect that the normal range is roughly between, say, 15 and 20 percent, 15 12 percent, then I know that, the, that this is a potential for a better spot to be buying volatility as long as we're getting that movement. And that leads to question number two, where is implied vol relative to historical vol? If implied vol again is around 12% and realized vol is closer to 20%, you know that we're looking more for a long option setup. If you're seeing something where implied vol is in the 20s and historical vol is in the teens, then you may not be able to do the setup, uh, your normal trading setup. You tend to be a long premium trader. The next one is where is the ski relative to the normal range? This is very important in commodities. If the call skew is very high, that tells you a lot of things. Number one, it tells you that there's a lot of interest buying gold calls, and number two, it tells you that your better setup might be in terms of buying call spread and, and or selling put spread. So if you're bearish, it's a little bit more difficult to enter your trade. If calls are cheap and puts are expensive relative to the normal range, it gives you a better opportunity to put on the bearish trade. And, and finally, I want you to think about the market trend. Gold does go through these long trends. We have that long uptrend from 2008 up to 2013, a little sideways market, downtrend with the rest of commodities, and now it seems to be turning. And as you think about the market trend, that should give you a little bit of perspective on what kind of skew you're looking at and what kind of market you're looking at trading. A, gold, a bearish gold market is a little more difficult to trade because it's like trading bear sticks. It grinds lower and then spikes higher. So if you're trading, say, just short the, uh, the equity or short the futures and you have this grinding lower market and it spikes higher, you're a lot of times stopped out of your trade. The great thing about options is that when you have that defined risk, you can stay in the trade and make the adjustments that you need when that happens. These trades have to be uh, taken advantage of when they're there, and then they have to be uh, adjusted as, they're, as the trade moves forward and against you. So getting into the actual trading styles, I think everybody has a little bit of a trading style. Personally, I've changed, I think, over time. When I first started into options, I tended to be more of a long premium trader, just generally speaking, long outright. I then switched a little bit more into relative value trading, so the you know long certain options and then short ones that I thought were overpriced, relatively speaking. And then I actually started getting a little bit more into being a short premium trader. And a lot of that's driven by moving from equities, where you have a lot of gap risk, you'd have a lot of takeovers, and obviously trading in 2008 and 2009, long options tended to work really well during the subprime crisis. And then going through the gold experience, you learn that with a lower volatility product, it doesn't have as much of a gap risk. Uh, you can really profit on both long and, and short options uh, plays. There are more complex just, uh, structures that we can start looking at. We're not going to go over too much of that today. I'm going to really focus on the long call spread and put spread and the short call spread and put spread. Long outright calls, long outright puts, short outright calls, short outright puts. That's a little bit, um, I think, introductory on that sort of stuff when you're looking at long outrights in gold. Uh, calls generally tend to be easier to get long just because of the way that that call skew works and the way that the explosive, explosive move tends to happen. You don't often have an explosive down move unless you're coming out of a big bubble. 2013, I think, was the, you know, one of the examples where you had a really explosive down move. But the explosive moves tend to be on the upside. So what I want you guys all to remember here is that you should use your preferred trading style when you're allocating the risk on these trades. If you uh, are hearing that you need to do a certain type of trading style that makes you uncomfortable, it's not going to be a profitable trade because you're just going to be on pins and needles the whole time. You should try to get comfortable with every trading style, but right now, as you go through this, your experience will dictate what you're most comfortable with, and that's how you should really trade these markets. Excuse me. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about what options I tend to avoid when you're looking at just an outright. It's really tempting to buy cheap wings and lottery tickets. You see gold rise from 1100 to over 1300 and when we were trading 1100 it would have been really tempting to buy those 1300 calls because they would have been so cheap. But buying lottery tickets is like, it, there's a reason they're called lottery tickets. There's a negative expected value on them. They don't really hurt you much due to the rate of decay. 
Mark had a great presentation on butterflies and condors on why you actually use these. Generally, you don't want to use them as your uh, the expression of your view. If you're bullish gold, I want to move from 1300 to 1400 or 1450 or 1500. I think you can do a lot better than just buying 1450 calls and hoping that they turn into a, a little bit of profit. Because they're so far out of the money, they really don't perform on that initial part of the move. So unless you're getting a big gap, you're just not going to make that much money on these. They do work work extremely well if you time to trade perfectly. So these lottery tickets can be a lot closer to the money if they're short duration. We're just a week away from expiration. We've got uh, in the gold futures options an expiration on Monday. If you had a really strong opinion that gold was going to move 25 bucks over the course of the next uh, really day and a half, Friday, and then you guess you get the weekend and, and into a little bit of Monday, then you can really make some money off of these. But the best professionals struggle the time perfectly. So for now, we're going to really avoid focusing on the wingy options in these lottery tickets unless it's a hedge to a short premium trade. So a short put spread where your long uh, put is on a teeny option could be helpful for you. But generally speaking, I'm going to avoid these almost altogether for most of what we're looking at right now because generally that's not our game to sell a really cheap put spread and, and just hope that it works out. At the same time, being long at the money options don't often pay you the way you want either. One of the interesting things that takes a while to learn in commodities just in, during the experience is that participant, market participants love to sell the retracement off. So what do I mean by that? I mean that when you start the day trading 1300 and you rally to 1325, the best offered option in the entire world is the 1300 option. That strike is hated by everybody. The reason that they hate it is because if you go right back down to it and you look at your daily realized volatility, it's zero. So the people that don't look at intraday movement say, well, there was no movement that day. And so the ball really gets hit if you move right back to where you started the day. Even if you move far away and then come right back, people don't think of it as being a big volatile day because they look at day-to-day -day closes more so than intraday movement. So you also get, that is basically a skew shift that's happening. As you rally from 1,300, the puts tend to get offered. As you sell off from 1,300, the calls tend to get offered. So you're going to get this interesting situation where you don't normally want to be long enough to money option because of the way that these things tend to perform, at least not in anything that has real volatility characteristics, so big Vega characteristics to them. So let's put a little bit of this together. Let's well, start off with the call spread side. If you are bullish and looking to build a call spread, we need a little bit of time to make sure that this plays out the way you want. Timing is always hard to perfect, unless you're trading an event. If you're looking at a Fed meeting, we've got one next week. Then, you know, you can go a little bit shorter duration. But to me, the sweet spot is really on these 60-day options. If you go much beyond that, if you're just paying too much to get into this, if you start getting into one and two standard deviation options, they're too far away from out the money. 60-day options is a really good sweet spot to try to trade some of this stuff, where you've got a little bit less impact on data, but you can get, you can really play some of the nuances from big and skew shifts that come along with that move that you are playing for. So when we construct the call spread, we're going to start off assuming implied balls within its normal range, in line with implied, uh, historical ball and skews in a normal range. Obviously, that's not usually going to be the case that all three of those are exactly in line with where you want, but let's just assume that that's, we can make some adjustments to the trade if any of those is out of whack, and we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, and um, a lot more about it in a week. So generally what I start with, if I'm bullish and I'm trying to construct a call spread, is I'm looking to buy a one standard deviation call. So that, right now, gold is trading 127, and implied ball is 16%. That call is about 135 about eight bucks out of the money. That's one standard deviation. I think you guys uh, have the, the calculation, but you would take, since we're looking at a 60-day option, roughly two months, that would be uh, one-sixth of a year. So you take the square root of a sixth, multiply it by 16%, and that's the percentage move for a single standard deviation. In general, that call spread, if you buy that one standard deviation call and sell that one and a half standard deviation call, it should be worth around 10% of the spread differential. What I mean by that is if we're looking at the 135, 140 call spread, that's $5 wide, it should be worth around 50 cents. This is a way to get you guys a lot of leverage. Obviously, the maximum value is $5. If you're getting it at 50 cents, you've got some good upside. Some of the other benefits of this is you're not experiencing too much in decay. Obviously, if you drop from 127 down to 120, you're going to get hit because you're 
you have the wrong delta, you have the wrong direction on the bias, but you're also not going to get hit too badly because you're not paying that much premium to get into this. And then you're left in a, a bear situation with a wingy option that doesn't decay that rapidly since we, we went with a 60-day option. I think there's a really good sweet spot to get into. You aren't going to run this all the way until it's worth $5. You're going to end up getting out somewhere around a buck and a half. Uh, so you're going to look at doubling or tripling your money. That's a really good trade. That's a home run. If you can double or triple your money every time you put on a trade, you are going to be an all-star in this industry. You're not going to just be sitting there trading your own money. You're going to be trading everybody's money. I want to give you guys a little bit of a picture of how this performs. So in my case, we did an entry price of $0.63. Cents. The value today, $0.53. Cents. If we rally immediately to 130 that's only a $30 move. That's about a two-and-a-half standard deviation move. All of a sudden, it's worth a little more than a buck. You've doubled your money in one day. If you get only a one standard deviation move, that's going to get you into the 128 and a half range. Uh, you picked up about 50% of your money. You were risking $0.53, cents and you've already made about a quarter. That's a really great performance. Where we are looking to exit this trade in that buck fifty range, you can see would be on a move around the lower strike. Why do we want to be so far on the money? One thirty five sounds like a lot. It also doesn't sound like that much. We've had a rally in GLD of twenty some odd dollars over the course of the last few months. Uh, and we could easily have that happen again if people start getting excited. So that's why we like to be a little farther out of the money. When you're right, volatility gets bid. When gold rallies and why volatility gets bid, that is the key to know. The same that volatility gets bid when S&P sell off, volatility gets bid when gold rallies. We don't necessarily want to drive all the way through our at our out of, excuse me our long call because then you start getting hit a little bit on the skew. So if you started off close to the money that's where you get a problem because you're actually not getting a lot of leverage and then you're going towards your short strike so it never really gets that high above 50% of the value of the spread. I've seen a number of times where you'll rally from your short long strike to your short strike or even through your short strike by 5%, 10% and yet that option spread is still only worth half of the spread differential. So you'd have the a potential situation where you can go to 145 and yet the 135, 140 call spread is only worth two and a half bucks. It's a little bit crazy how big that skew is and when you see that it's, it's a great selling opportunity but you didn't really pick up the amount of money that you wanted at the end of the day you've made a lot more money if you stayed longer and not further out of the money option spread one that started at 10 percent and got to 25 or 30 percent for you in this rally your long big is going to work really well if you're right and gold rallies your skew gets bid on a rally so that hurts you a little bit the 140 call becomes more of a skew based option the 135 call is more of a ball based option because your vol and delta pickup work so well, that's why you're okay being long that call spread that's further out of the money. If you're on gold bits, you're a little bit on theta. We know that the short option is decaying pretty rapidly here because of the way that we're trading this out. This goes back a little bit to the uh, butterfly and condor presentation that Mark put up. And finally, if you're long gold, for example, I already mentioned this, you're going to lose about half of the value. That's a tough situation to be in. Let's say you bought a tap on You put five bucks into this trade, you're down 250 bucks, and you're trying to decide what do I want to do next. This is an action point. You have to make an adjustment. You didn't, you don't. If you were entering the trade at that point, you do not want to be buying a 25 cent call spread. It's just not the great setup that you're looking for. There's a lot of ways we can adjust this trade, whether it's rolling everything down via an out of the line butterfly, doing some other stuff. We're going to follow up on a little more on that in a longer class because I think that there's a lot of nuance to that. So right now. What you really want to focus on is when you're right, how to get paid, and when you're wrong, how to avoid losing the money. And by putting yourself into this kind of structure, I think you're going to get yourself set up for a lot more potential for the profit side without really taking a huge risk here. On the other side, let's say you're more of a short premium kind of guy. You like to sell uh, premium, you like to sell put spreads, you like to sell call spreads, you like to put on iron butterflies and iron condors and all this stuff so that every day you're collecting a little bit of theta. But we got to make sure that this is close enough to add the money that you're going to collect a decent amount of premium. But we're still sitting at 60-day options because I don't want us to get completely screwed up if we get one bearish day in gold. Sometimes it happens. Sold off from 1350 down to 1300, back up to 1320. You're getting all these these kind of moves, and right now a normal standard deviation is only 13 dollars in a single day. Over the course of two months, it's eight dollars. That gives you a lot more leeway here. So what I want to look at is doing selling a 
about 25 or 0.25 standard deviation put and buying a 0.05 standard deviation put. I tend to let these have standard deviation wide spreads because they avoid giving you too much skew risk. I think the professionals, um, and I traded gold, you know, uh, through one of my firms for three or four years. I think we tended to be better at trading wider skew, but it can get really funky. And I don't think you guys want to focus on that. That's more of a, it requires a lot more day to day management or even hour to hour management. If you do this half standard deviation widespread, you're going to avoid having to have too much management of the skew trade that you got on. And you don't want to really focus on the skew risk because I think, generally speaking, you're going to be better off focusing your trade on the delta and then the absolute return profile, the delta, the gamma, and the vega, more so than the skew. If you structure it this way, your put spread is going to be, going to be worth about 30% of spread differential. One of the benefits of being short of put spread is that 0.75 standard deviation put is going to have a lower implied vol than the 0.25 standard deviation put. This is a wonderful little feature. They're basically giving you cheap insurance for being short at put. So you're short of 0.25 standard deviation put, and then you get to insure that with a cheaper option. That's great. It's basically saying that you know you gotta you're collecting some premium on you know at the risk of breaking an arm, and then they're gonna give you cheap life insurance. Awesome. When you have this situation, you have to close the trade when it gets down to 10 to 15 percent of the spread differential. So again, this is kind of the inverse of the call spread, where we were trying to enter the long when it was a 10 percent of the spread differential and exit when it got to 30 percent. This time we're going to try to enter at 30 percent and exit around 10 to 15 percent. With GLD trading 127 and high ball 60 percent again, this would put us in the September 125 121 put spread, about a buck and a quarter, so a little more than 30 percent. Looking at exiting that around 40 cents, 45 cents maybe in that range. That would be a great pickup here. You sell 10 lot. Your original premium collection is $1,250, and if yeah, it all goes well, you're going to make about 800 bucks on that trade. That's a great trade. Again. If you can make trades like this every time, you're going to be, you know, a millionaire quickly. I wish I was. <laughs> uh, so going into the actual performance here, you can see the benefit of being short the put spread, and this is, you know, a lot of you uh, premium collectors really like about short options, I'm sure. And that is that if we sit here for three weeks, six weeks, all the way to expiration, and you just slowly collect this money getting a paycheck every day as long as we don't break. And if we break down to 125 and a half over the course of six weeks, you broke even. That's not that big of a deal. And if you just say a stuck with the trade at that point, you'd make even more money again. I wouldn't recommend keeping it that long as we get closer to expiration three weeks, four weeks, five weeks from now. Now we're talking about a shorter duration option. It's got a little bit of a different risk profile. Again, we'd be looking to potentially tr uh, rotate the trade into something else and saying, well, I'm glad that I just broke even in spite of having the wrong direction on this. Now, again, when I've talked about this, we were talking about trying to close around 40 cents. It's not going to get there quickly if we get a rally right now. If we get a rally over the course of a month to about 130, that's where you're going to get paid out there. Remember on the call spread, we needed to move up above 134, 135 kind of range to get paid. So that's really the biggest difference to me on the put spread versus the call spread. The put spread, you can get paid on a smaller move up, but you're not going to get paid as much if you have a bigger move up. So you guys have to decide how bullish gold I am when you're setting this trade up. If you uh, think that gold at 1500 is within reason because the Fed's never going to raise rates and they're just going to even talk about maybe doing more uh, quantitative easing, which has been some people's thesis, then you've got to be more in the call spread camp. If you're thinking that it's just a matter of everybody sitting on their hands and nothing changing and that means gold has to rally a little bit, then the short put spread is really going to pay off well for you and you can make a lot of money being short this put spread. It's a great way to set it up. So we'll get a little more on why we chose these strikes. You want to rally away from your short strike because of what we talked about earlier. People love selling their retracement option. So in this case, we rally away. We actually get a little bit of a skew benefit because people are selling us that retracement strike, and our long put gets into that point where it's actually getting close to being a lottery ticket, so it doesn't need to decay anymore. You're just getting the, the wall hit and the theta from the uh, short put that you had on there. Put skew gets hit really well in a rally. Is there also talk of gold bears rolling up their long put and saying, well, you should be out that money. So there's a little more on that. So if you were short that 125 put, somebody else was long on that 125 put. If we rally to 130, they start saying, well, the 125 put doesn't matter anymore. I'll just buy the 128, 125 put spread to adjust my position. I'm not saying that they're wrong to adjust their position in that way. They're probably right. 
but that's actually what gives us a good benefit of being short this other put spread. Implied vault does traditionally get a bit on the rally, so you have to get a little bit of a benefit from the skew, the delta, and the theta here to offset, and that's what we're really uh, shooting for here. So if you're wrong, it's not uh, ideal, obviously. Your spread probably value increases from 30 to 50% of the differential. So you're not actually risking that full uh, $4. At some point, it gets to about 2 bucks. It gets to 2 bucks actually a little quicker than you would think. It doesn't get there when you're halfway between the two strikes. It gets there a little bit before that because of the skew. But then again, that's you know a decent way out of the money. You're looking for $4 plus downside. So basically, if you're wrong, you're wrong. You're going to lose money, but we're trying to reduce the amount of money that you lose by having the right options set, uh, set up here. The good thing about this is that you get the skew working for you. They'll be selling you the put that you go through. Even though you go through your short strike, they're actually going to sell that to you because it becomes a retracement option on that grind lower. And then people are looking for protection on the downside, so they may be buying that 121 put from you just a little to look for doing protection as you break. So while you lose money, the option characteristics do help you lose less than if you were just long GLD stock. So now we have to try the other side. The other side is harder. That's the bearish trade. So I talked about earlier, when gold is bullish, it's exciting. You're going to have a day where you walk in and gold's up 25 bucks, and you're going to be able to take money on all, or sorry, I guess that's GC. I've got to think about GLD terms. And GLD is like two and a half bucks, maybe three bucks, and you're going to be taking money on your long trades. You're going to be looking to adjust. You're going to be taking money off the table. You're going to be putting money in your pocket. You're getting all this great action, and you're really excited about it. When gold is bearish, generally speaking, you have a lot of smaller moves. You walk in and it's down 50 cents. And the next day, it's down 50 cents. The next day, it's up 25 cents. The next day, it's down 50 cents. So when you get an initial turnaround of that that bullish trade, yeah, you're going to get you know one or two big breaks. But then after that, it's a really grind lower move. Again, I mentioned the VIX. It's kind of a similar product in that sense. Gold or the VIX does not spike from 16 to 11. It might spike down from you know 35 to 30, but once it gets down into those teens, it doesn't spike down anymore. And gold is very much the same way. It spiked down from 1900, but it doesn't spike down from 1200. One of the things that I'm very much an advocate of is because the skew is against you you need to go a little shorter duration on this trade. We're going to target 30-day options. You need to avoid giving up as much of a vol edge. If you're buying a put spread, the put you're buying is going to have a higher vol than the put you're selling. If that differential is as much as, say, 2%, that's a big edge to give up when you're looking at a long vega, a big long vega trade, especially since vol tends to get hit on break, which is a product of the skew, of course. So when we construct this put spread, we're going to assume that implied ball again is within its normal range, in line with historical ball and skews in its normal range. All this kind of goes out the window when you have a big up there, a big down there, because some of the stuff moves. But we're really, really carefully trying to put, pick this. So we're going to buy it just out of the money put. And it's all about a half a standard view and put out of the money. That situation does exactly the opposite of what we were talking about in the bullish trade. You're already paying 30% spread differential. So why am I paying 30% of the spread differential when beforehand when I was a ball I was telling you to collect 30% of the spread differential? The big key here is that it's shorter duration. Because it's shorter duration, you're going to get the move quicker on that bearish break. It's not going to take $4 to get you to 50% of the spread differential. Now it's only going to take about a buck and a half. And that's the key. See the GLD trading 127 and five ball at 16%. We're looking at the 27 and 124 foot spread for a buck 20. I'm sorry, that should say, uh, I think I had the wrong numbers on there because it, it should be closer to 30% of the differential. I, might have, I think I had it wrong. It should be the 126, 123 foot spread, I believe, to get you up to 90 cents. So you're looking for about a $2 break, $2.5 break to get to that 50% of the spread differential. Again, it's not a huge move. We're looking for that equivalent in GC of 25 bucks. Today's range in gold. It started off the day around 13.20, got down to 13.10, right up to about 13.30. So we had had a $2 range in GLD, a $20 range in, in gold futures. So you get that range in potentially one day. When you're bearish and you're using the options, you cannot really pay for big leverage. You can't buy the 10%, um, the put spread that is with 10% of spread differential because of that grinding market style. It is just too far out of the money for you to ever really get paid. It's a really hard trade to make if you do that. 
I'm not going to put up a graph on this. You've seen the graphs on the other ones. I really actually prefer the bullish trade on a lot of these call spreads and put spreads because I think that's where you get a little bit more excitement here. But I do think that it needs to be touched on how to put this on for a bearish trade. I do think there are better bearish trades that I'm going to touch on uh, in next week's class. But right now for the bearish put spread, I want you to know that long put, if now in the money when you sell off, implied ball is going to get hit. So you have to get through your long strike and get towards your short strike. And that's why doing those really leveraged bearish trades just really don't work because you're just going towards your long strike and ball is getting hit. So you're not getting that accelerated payoff from ball. This is also why we go into more gamma. But if you get the bid on sell-off, you need delta and gamma to dominate your PL. You're in a put spread, and the puts come up relative to the calls. You're in a little bit of a trouble situation on skew on that break. So you really need this trade to be focused on delta and gamma. So I go shorter dates and duration and closer to the money. It's a little more structured in a way that what we're doing here is trying to give you the defined risk more so than the leverage. That's the benefit of your options here. You want a situation where if gold rallies $25, you don't have to mortgage your house. What I need you to do is in that case, still be alive and still be looking to just adjust the trade as opposed to closing up your account. So as I said, bearish gold, a little harder to go than bullish gold, but that's why we have to be very, very precise with our options on this because if you think that gold can drop 50 bucks in a day, or sorry, GLD five dollars in a day. You may be right, but if you do that too many, if you make that bet too many times, you'll probably end up losing more often than you win. If you're on gold sits, I mean, you're going to lose on theta, but the wingy option is decaying a little more rapidly here to help. Now, I don't want to really call it too wingy because it's still only a half a standard deviation out of the money, but it is a little bit wingier, and that option is a little faster than the other money. If your gold wrong and gold trades higher, implied ball increases. That helps you. That keeps you a little bit more in the game. The push spread drop about 90 cents to you know, maybe 60, 70 cents. You lose a little bit of money. Put skis getting hit against you a little bit, which hurts. But because the implied ball increased, you got a little bit of savings there. But again, when you're bearish, you have to be pretty well on time. So you have to be a little more precise on your time. Where I said in the call side, we can be patient because when you're bullish and the market's bullish, you're going to get good updates and that you can take money on. When you're bearish, you don't always get um, the first day or the second day or the third day bearish. You may sit for three days before dropping, you know, 50 cents in GLD. And so that's where it's a little tougher. So you have to have your catalyst in line, or, and it could be a technical level. It can be a, a Fed meeting. It can be a number of things. It could be a month on day number. You just have to have something your way that's driving you into that trade. And if you don't have a reason to drive into that bearish trade, then you kind of have to sit it out until you do see that thing that's going to push you uh, in the money. A little bit easier than the, bull, the bearish put spread is the bearish call spread. It's so a selling a call spread. We're looking at that same time frame because I, I still believe that you need to have your timing a little bit better on the bearish trade. Let's be a little closer out the money because we're still trying to get that 25 to 30 percent of the spread situation like we had when we were bullish and constructing a short put spread. The only way that you really get paid there is you have to have it worth at least 25 to 30 percent of the spread if you're only doing a lift. If you were going to do some sort of iron butterfly or iron condor. You can maybe do a little bit less, but you know, you don't necessarily want to put up a bunch of positions where you're selling cheap options and just you know waiting for them to decay. They take a little bit too long to decay in a lot of those times, especially when you're looking at 30 day options. So if you have two day options, you can make your money really fast. Generally, we're going to close that trade when it gets to 10 percent of the differential. That's where we were we would be entering if we were bullish on a call spread. So that's actually where I'm going to be exiting when I'm bearish and putting on a call spread. If I'm actually entering this short call spread at the level I was going to be closing my bullish call spread situation. It's about 25, uh, 0.25 standard deviation call we're selling. And that second range to buying, but we're going to buy that 0.75 standard deviation call. With GLD trading 127, that's about the 129, 132 call spread. It's about 80 cents. It's a little bit more than 25% of the spread differential. And it closed at around 30, 35 cents. It's decent money made, but it's a little less money than you're going to be making when you have the bullish trade because that skew goes against you. The call skew will get hit on a sell-off. So originally, when you're putting on this trade, you are long call skew. You are short the slightly out of the money call and longer further out of the money call. As you roll down, the further out of the money call gets pretty much down to the point where it's just a unit. It doesn't really have any ball characteristics anymore. It just has that unit risk to it. 
the call that you're short is now a call that actually has the benefit when call skew gets hit, you make a little bit of money. It's a great situation to be in, and that's one of the benefits here that you get from being short a call spread on a bearish board. The glide ball is going to get hit usually on the sell off. You don't need to collect as much theta as you would if you were going to do is, you know, say an at the money option and a half standard deviation on the money call. And you don't have to have as much short data. So that's why we went 30 days instead of 50. Every part of the uh, option characteristic really kind of goes your way when you sell off and you're short of call spread. Ball goes down. You collect a little theta. Your short delta is working. And your skew is working. This is a really good situation. You don't need to collect a ton of data by being short, really short data options. You don't need to short a lot of data by being short, really long data options. You can get into this nice little window as long as your timing is good. In theory, you want to adjust these trades instead of closing, but in practice, always be closing. ABC, always be closing. When you've got a good win and you've made good money, a lot. I always advocate close the trade and start again from square one where you're looking at the initial setup. Where's implied variable ball? Where's historical ball? Where's skew? What's your trend? And just start from square one because that's the way for you to make sure that you're putting on the right trade instead of just sitting out of the sitting in a trade for too long, especially that bear streak. As I said, you can sit there and make money, make money, make money, make money, make money, and then all of a sudden on day seven, market spikes and you lose everything that you did. If you're wrong, you know, again, it's not going to be great for you. Spread's going to increase from 25 or 30 percent to 40, 45 percent of the differential. So you're risking about 15 percent of the differential to make 15 percent of the differential. It's a one to one dive trade. If you sit, you know that you make money because you're short theta. That's great. Or sorry, you're collecting data. You're short gamma. The skew works for you if you're wrong because that out of the money call you are long gets a bid. The out of the money call that you are short is now an in the money call. Option characteristic wise, you're basically short now. Nobody put now that skew gets hit because that's a retracement option. Everything goes well for you there, but ball gets a bit too. And now you're short and at the money option if you just got that small rally. If you get a really bad situation and you're really wrong, everything but the delta goes in your but that's actually okay. Because as I said, you can have that situation where you rally $5 in GLD and this call spread doesn't go over 50% of the differential. That is an excellent time to just take your losses and walk away. You lost what you had risked, and you could have lost a lot more if it took a lot of time to rally, but because it happened so fast and everything went bid, you had a great return, which was losing what, losing 25% of the spread. While you lose money, the option characteristics help you lose less than if you were short the stock. So short of call spread is actually a really good trade because generally speaking, all the option characteristics work your way, whether you're up or down. The problem is, of course, delta. If you're, if you're short a call spread and you're bullish, obviously you're not going to make money on that position. You can sell a call spread against a bullish position, say your long stock in front of call spread. You know, it's a little bit of a way to basically give yourself a short-term hedge if you're uh, temporarily a little bit concerned about a less bullish market. But generally, what I'm looking for here is just outright what the option structure you're going to put on as opposed to what the hedge to a stock position you want to put on. So generally speaking, I like the short call spread if you're bearish. It's a little bit of a tough trade because of the way the bearish trade tends to work in gold. But at the end of the day, a pretty good trade in terms of most of the skew characteristics and ball characteristics. So I mentioned at the beginning, what if implied ball is not normal? So we have this whole setup assuming implied ball is normal. If it's low relative to the normal range, you want to be long calls for a bullish trade. Simple as that. Instead of being long that uh, one standard deviation call, you could go a little bit higher to 1.25 standard deviation because if implied ball is low, one standard deviation is no longer going to be eight dollars, maybe it's six and a half bucks. So you still may target that eight dollar out of the money uh, strike, but it's a higher standard deviation when you enter it. It's really good for you. You get a little bit of a cheaper call. You're getting something that should be going for two bucks for a buck sixty. That's not a bad situation to be in. It's on sale. Everybody loves an option on sale. If you're a bear, you generally still need to be in the put spread, though, unless those prices are an extreme high and coming back down. If you've had a rally like we had, you know, in 2000, in, up into 2013, where we got up towards $1,800, $1,900 in, uh, in the gold futures, we had those big breaks, obviously long puts worked. But when you're sitting here at $1,300 an ounce, 127 in GLD, buying a bunch of the 120 puts, 
still not going to pay you that much unless you get this asymmetric break. So that has to be a different market setup that's really driving you to think that bearish gold has a great R and R where you're going to go to 110 in GLD from 127. If you don't see that, stay with the put spread even though implied ball is low. Maybe just go a little further out of the money, like we talked about for the call. If implied ball is high relative to the normal range, as usually you're going to see that the short premium trades will be a little bit more enticing. But what you want to see, similar to what we talked about, Mark talked about in his butterfly trade, is a situation where implied ball is high relative to the normal range but falling. If implied ball is continuing higher, it could spike higher. Selling a bunch of premiums is not going to help you out that much. It's a little easier to say that you can be short that premium in a bullish market with implied ball high because we know that implied ball could continue to go higher, but at least you've got the delta going your way. The one caveat to this is, as I mentioned, either implied ball increasing or historical ball very high. Implied ball is sitting at 20%, and historical ball is 30%. You still can't be short 20% implied volatility. It's just a, it's a fool's game. You're getting too much daily movement to stay in the trade. Implied historical ball is generally going to be a bigger driver for our decision than where implied ball is relative to the normal range. It's particularly on those shorter day of options when we're in that bull bearish trade. So if implied ball is low relative to historical ball, we're better off being long calls for bullish trade. If implied ball is high relative to the normal range and low relative to historical ball, you just got to reduce the duration. Now you want a more gamma intense option and less big. Gamma is your trade for when historical ball is crazy. Vega is your trade when implied ball is really cheap. Always remember that. When you're trading gamma, you're trading historical ball and the relationship between current implied ball and historical ball. And Vega is when you're trading the implied ball versus the normal level of implied volatility. Still obviously need to be in a put spread as a bear unless prices are an extreme high. I'm always going to advocate that you don't be long out right puts in gold. It's just a really tough trade. If implied ball is high relative to historical ball, short premium trades again more enticing. Unless you're trading a big event. If you look down the historical ball at 10% and implied ball at 20%, and you have a Brexit vote that night, you've got a problem here that does not allow you to sell implied ball, especially in short traded options. You don't want to be short gamma going into a big event. That's the, one of the bigger risks you need to take. So let's get a little bit further here on and say, what if skew is involved? If call skew is low relative to the normal range, we're better off being long calls once again. What you're saying, they're saying is that basically a lot of people look at it and say, well, if call skew is uh, low, that means that there's not a lot of people out there chase buying calls. So maybe you're seeing something that the rest of the market didn't see. If you started getting bullish gold at the beginning of this year, you saw something the market didn't necessarily see. Implied ball was pretty low, call skew was pretty low, market rallied pretty well. So you may have actually done pretty well just being long calls. Now a lot of people are seeing that bullish gold situation, call skews recovered. Everything is pretty uh, in line there with the call skews, so call spreads going to be a little bit better. Again, on the bearish trade, put spreads and call spreads are still going to be better for the bear. You're actually getting a benefit now if you're the bear because calls are cheap, puts are more expensive. Buying a put spread is now a bit of a cheaper uh, trade. And selling call spreads, you pay, uh, you're collecting a lot more premium. You don't have to pay up as much for that out of the money call that you're buying to protect your uh, bearish bias. <laughs> and finally, if call skews high, the bullish trade is easier and the bearish trade is impossible. The market's telling you you're wrong. When call skew is really, really high, it means that everybody in the world has bought calls. May or may not have sold the puts, but everybody in the world is buying far out of the money calls. They're seeing explosive potential from the upside. Sure, you could grind lower. What is the real benefit of putting out a trade for a grind lower? You're long a put spread. You're selling a really cheap put, relatively speaking, in terms of buy ball. Or if you're short a call spread, you're buying a really expensive call. It's really expensive to put that on in skew terms. And the market is telling you there's something extremely bullish out there and that there's limited downside. So you have a really tough time putting on any sort of bearish trade when the call skew is really high. A lot easier to be long the call spread, as I mentioned, because you got that really expensive uh, far out of the money call, making the call spread cheaper. But good lord, it is hard to be bearish when call skew's high. 
a little bit of a summary here, guys. Calls, uh, gold is a great commodity for uh, for trading. Thanks to so many drives for website. What went too far there? Uh, thanks to many drivers for movement here. You've got a lot of stuff going on all the time. You've got catalysts every day. You've got Brexit. You've got the Fed. You've got non-farm payrolls. I mentioned them all. If you're looking at all your macro things, it really creates some excitement. You can have a, a good standard deviation, two standard deviation move almost any day. Bullish gold environments are really much easier to trade than the bearish. This can be true for both the market bull and the market bear. So when the market is bullish, you are going to have a little bit of an easier, bigger break to the market. We talked a lot about that grind lower. You can get a little bit bigger break if you get a big rally and the market's exhausted, you can get a big break. Now the bear can make a little bit of money by trading the extremes as opposed to trading that grind lower. If you train the extremes, being a bear is a little easier. Bearish markets in gold trade like bearish markets in the VIX. They grind lower over time, but occasionally spike higher and take you out of your trade. So you have to be a little bit more uh, careful when you're bearish. Bullish, you're going to have up and down days, obviously, but you're going to have bigger up days than, than the down days, usually. You need to know your implied ball regime. That was important from what we talked about. When the implied ball is low, you can get along a lot of cheap calls. Know your skew regime. When calls are expensive, you have to be in call spreads. Know your catalysts. If you see Brexit in the you know, horizon, that's a really big risk to trying to put on a big bearish trade, especially one that was short call spread. Don't get greedy. The market moves for or against you and you want to stay in the trade, then it's time for you to adjust the trade. And that gets me to the next time. I want to add more to the complexity of the gold trade. The bearish trade is hard, but there are ways that you can uh, achieve better results from these than just a simple call spread or put spread. Talking about potential for calendars, maybe some ratio spreads. There's some good stuff there, and they're actionable trades. They're really good. These are the ones that I actually would normally do for myself if I was going to put on a bearish trade in gold. They're a little more complex, so they require a little bit more work in trying to figure out what exactly you're putting on. But they are ways for you to make a little bit um, more money, and really it's every time you can find a way to make a little bit more money, that little bit of edge, you're going to make a little more money. Again, I'll, I'll reference back to the uh, butterfly and condor, such, condor trade. <clears throat> Mark mentioned trying to make a dollar per contract. That's a penny. If you can add more complexity, and in, in doing so, add one, two, three cents to your expected return, that is a really, really good trade. Silver. We're going to touch on silver. Silver can be a lot more exciting than gold. The magnitude of moves in silver can be crazy, both on the upside and on the downside. And the liquidity in silver can be crazy at times, too. Sometimes it's just not there. You want to be in those options before the liquidity dries up and get, getting to take them off when the liquidity dries up because guess what? That's where everybody else is in trouble and you're making money. This is a really good uh, commodity. I actually really like trading silver. I traded a lot of silver when I was uh, managing my gold portfolio. A lot of fun. It's a really exciting commodity and it gets a lot more movement. It's not a 16 ball product in the 20s. It's been in the 30s, 40s. It's been a pretty volatile product and, and it's really exciting. It's a lot of fun. We're going to talk to the energy commodities and ETFs. There are differences between the energy commodities and ETFs and uh, what you see in precious. Energies have contango. That means that you're paying a cost to carry them. The amount of space it takes to store one gold bar is roughly, which is roughly the size of what, my forearm? And that's worth half a million bucks. A half a million dollars of crude right now, 10,000 barrels. You guys know what a barrel size is. It's you know a trash can on the street. That is a lot more space, and that's, so you have to pay money to store that, and it costs money to store those. It doesn't cost almost anything to store gold. You put it in your, uh, put it just about anywhere. When it's the size you're on for a half a million bucks. Agricultural commodities are also very exciting. We do a lot of agricultural stuff. Um, they're really driven by weather, which is a really interesting market to be trading. The same thing happens in natural gas as you see in the agricultural commodities. When you get really hot weather, it destroys a crop. When you get really hot weather, people need their air conditioning. There's a lot of interesting things that, that are generated based on weather, and that's what creates a seasonal market. And that's actually a really exciting thing to trade because seasonal markets create really opportunistic trades where you know you might be really excited about trading natural gas in uh, August, but you might be really excited about trading natural gas because of um, the winter situation from 2000 and what was that 13, 14, where you had record cold. I mean, natural gas are very explosive market, very good for trading too. 
So we're going to talk about that and how you can structure your trades around these things because they get very exciting. They are going to be more focused on the future side instead of the ETFs, which I think is also a great opportunity because you guys, as you get more complexity in here, you're going to want to get into the futures uh, options for a little bit higher value. Each ticket is worth a little bit more, but they have a lot of ways to make money on it, and you, you can really do well with that. So we're talking here now, Mark mentioned at the very beginning, special offer. Next Saturday, the 30th, 9.30 Eastern time, we're going to talk gold, we're going to talk oil, we're going to talk natural gas, we're going to talk agriculture. We're going to talk about a lot of these commodities, and we're going to get you a primer on all of it. And we're going to get in-depth on all of it, and we're going to give you actionable strategies here. We're going to master some long-term strategies to replace your stocks. Trading stock is a fun game. Trading options is a longer-term strategy that can make you a lot more money. We're going to figure out how to extract some dollars from long-term option trading here. You're going to make some good money off of a lot of the trades that we can uh, give you advice on. Obviously, at the end of the day, it's your decision how you want to risk your money, but I think there's some really good ways to make to you know reduce your risk and, and increase your upside in these markets. We're going to talk about hedging and protecting the assets. I mentioned before, when you've got your moves, a lot of times I, I recommend ABC always be closing, but there are other ways to adjust your trade. When it starts going your way, there's ways to adjust it. When it goes against you, there are ways to adjust it. They can give you that extra one, two, three, five cents. And then when you, if you can add those up on every single trade, you can make a lot more money over time, and you can be a lot more successful as an options trader. And of course, the key, managing risk. Everybody likes to look at the dollar side, but on the upside, we want to manage the risk as well when it goes against you. And professionals have always had an opportunity to sit in that chair and figure out how to manage the risk. And everybody's a great trader when they're making money. It's how do you trade well when you're losing money. So if you use this code, 25 off, it'll take an extra 25 bucks off the price if you sign up by Monday. So it won't be 167, it'll be $142. It's a good deal. Looking at it originally, it's normally 297. So we're less than half the price if you just use your code, 25 off to sign up for that class next Saturday. Um, at that, Mark, are you back on? Let me see here. You know, I don't know if Mark is uh, going to be able to join us back in here, but at this point, uh, I'm going to give him one more minute to see if he wants to join us, but if you guys have any questions that you want to throw into chat, I am happy to answer anything you've got here. Uh, oh, you know, this one, I just see the question from earlier. Uh, is this for new traders? So this is, uh, I would say, what we've done here today can be used by new or medium traders. Um, you know, I think getting into GLD is a little bit tougher when, when you're brand new. Um, you know, we talked a lot about skew and, and some of the nuance there. So I don't think you want to be necessarily looking for skew nuances when you're a new trader. You're going to be focused more on volatility and looking at uh, gambling data. Uh, let me just check in with Mark here and see if he's going to be able to get back on here. Uh, yes, my name is Keith Harwood. I, uh, as I, um, I, so I, somebody asked if I, they can know my name. I've, uh, my name is Keith Harwood. I've been doing this for over 10 years now. Um, started as a market maker, prop trader, now I work for a fund. So I've done this basically for every step of the way in, in the professional element, I guess. Uh, I have, can I go long gold fusion and buy put options to hedge? Will this strategy work? I don't like the trade doing that. Um, you're buying a cheap all when you buy put options to hedge a long gold future strategy, but you're buying the wrong option. You're, you're, you're paying for leverage on something that doesn't have a leverage type move normally. Uh, if you're bullish, I'd rather you be long a call spread or add them a call than a put. That's how you get a lot more leverage. It, you know, if you're looking for just for the defined risk character, I go for long put spread as a hedge over a long put. But generally speaking, I, if you're bullish, I don't, wouldn't hedge too much with a long outright put. It's just uh, I think you're going to lose a lot of money there. You're going to spend a lot of premium to hedge a position. Dollar shoots up generally. That's going to be bearish for gold. Um, you know, right now we're in a situation where 
the dollar is continuing higher and gold is continuing higher, and a lot of that's based upon central bank situations. Um, you, you look at what they're doing in Europe because they're printing so much money. You got to put your money somewhere, and if you don't have faith in paper money, you're going to put your money in, uh, in in the precious metals, gold, silver, other sources of uh, other ways to save money. I mean, when you, when you have to pay 0.4 percent to store your money, that's a problem. Uh, somebody asked if the, were, the session was recorded. Yes, uh, it was recorded. Um, we're going to offer trades after July 30th. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll talk through some specific trades and we talk again on July 30th again. Uh, I think that that's, you know, the most you know, insightful way, I guess, to go through a lot of stuff is to make sure everybody sees actual trades that we would be considering putting on. Um, but again, I, you know, I, I can't force you into a trade. That's going to have to be your final decision at the end of the day of where you want to risk your money. Uh, yeah. So spread differential, I think uh, I mentioned earlier, the spread differential is basically when you look at the call versus the, the call spread. If you're looking at the 135, 140 call spread, you just take the differential between the two strikes, so that's five bucks. So I'm looking, when I'm talking about things like 30% of the spread differential, I'm saying that 30% of five dollars, so a buck and a half. All right, is the session recorded? Uh, isn't selling paint very dangerous? Yes and no. Uh, selling options is very dangerous. That's why I tend to prefer selling call spreads and put spreads. You have a defined risk element. You know that the maximum, you know your max loss potential, uh, but you do have to be cautious when you're selling because you're not doing a leverage trade. You're doing something that is more profitable when the market uh, sits so. Continuing on here. Oh, what we have here? Oh, I'm sorry about the garbled. Hopefully, it, it got better. Uh, do I consider gold a fear gauge or a global currency? Yes, both. <laughs> uh, when gold really spikes, though, uh, we, if you want the best fear gauge, it's probably more the VIX. Uh, global currency is probably a better way to describe it right now, uh, but it does do a little bit of both. Uh, yeah, gold, gold is, I think I mentioned this before with uh, gold and the dollar. Generally speaking, when the dollar rallies, gold will go down. When the dollar breaks, gold will rally. Uh, basically, it's the sort of trade-off of which currency you want to be in. Do you want to be in U.S. dollars? Do you want to be in gold? Um, but that, does, that uh, relationship does not always hold, as we're seeing you know, recently. The name of my trainer, I started at the same from the Mark Sebastian and he was actually one of the guys that taught me how to trade originally. Recorded, yes. All right, I think that's all of our questions. So uh, at this point, uh, it doesn't look like Mark's going to get back on, but if anybody has any final questions, I can answer them right now. And if not, we will uh, look forward to seeing you guys on July 30th. Again, use that code, 25 off. You're going to get 25 extra dollars off the price if you sign up on Monday. So, uh, Keith, how did oh, the, the webinar know. go? That's going really well here. I, you know, I was just going through the questions here, and I had one more. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, I want to kind of understand more of that next week. All right, so you just answer your questions. Sorry, go ahead, can see the deal. I just realized that I I put the wrong bullet points in, but uh, aside from that, uh, the the offer and deal is the same. It's uh, July thirtieth at nine thirty a.m. But oshpit.com slash oil, and uh, Keith, you can tell them what they're going to learn. And, uh, you know, I want to thank you for coming. Uh, feel free to answer questions. Just close up the webinar when you're done. And uh, we will uh, go from there. Yeah. It looks like we got just a couple more questions. Again, uh, you know, our real. In the precious stuff, but I, I really think that there's some good opportunities in oil and all, uh, a lot of times with sandball there. Natural gas is getting a little bit more. Be the bigger driver um, for what we'll be.
you next.